You probably already know that Ryzen 3rd Gen parts are fast. Ever since the 3900X dropped this summer, people have been drooling in anticipation about what boosted clock speeds, shrunken manufacturing node, and improved IPC might mean for an inevitable Threadripper release. It's taken a little while for those parts to actually get into consumers' hands, but I gotta tell you, the wait was more than worth it. With slick new aesthetic features and Fractal Design's legendary build quality, the new Vector RS has arrived to make your choice easy when looking for a premium ATX tower. Featuring tempered glass on the side, front, and the top, the Vector RS lets you customize both your internal and external layout to optimize for airflow, massive storage arrays, or maximum RGB flavor. Available in both standard and dark versions, the Vector RS is ready for your next build. Check out the link below to learn more. I've only had this Threadripper 3960X for a few days, and in that time, I've been basically planning a water-cooled system around it and trying to figure out if replacing my Ryzen 9 3950X build is actually worth it. I had the opportunity to scoop a 3970X instead, but passed on that as I think the workloads that are most applicable to me don't necessarily scale with the additional cores and they certainly aren't worth the extra $600. So the 3960X is what we'll be working with today and I'll spoil the rest of the video right up front. This is the fastest CPU that I've ever owned or ever even tested. And that certainly was not the case with Threadripper 1 or 2. So what monumental change happened between second and third gen that allows me to make that unequivocal statement? It basically all comes down to memory control and access between the CCXs. AMD builds their Threadripper chips using multiple dies on one package with each die containing four, six, eight cores, etc., depending on generation. With the 2950X, there were four CCXs with four cores each, but only two of those CCXs had memory controllers on them, meaning that in order for the other two CPU dies to access system memory, they had to reach across the Infinity fabric, which is AMD's term for the interconnect between the CCXs, and request access from the CCX that actually had direct access to memory. This is why AMD introduced game mode to those processors by which you could actually disable the CCXs that did not contain memory controllers. And the two remaining would be able to operate faster and more efficiently, leading to better per core performance. Here's a quick diagram to illustrate. Here's your motherboard. Here's your CPU socket. Here are your memory channels. Threadripper 1 had four CCXs on the package, but only two of them had the memory controllers. So this one has, let's say this one has a memory controller and this one has a memory controller. So this CCX has uh, two memory channels out and two, this one has two memory channels out. So this CCX talks to this memory bank, this CCX talks to this memory bank. And these two CCXs have no access, no direct access to memory. In order to get access to memory, they actually have to request it from one of the other CCXs that have memory access. And the CCXs that have memory access have only access to two channels, not four. But AMD realized that they could vastly improve performance by giving equal access to memory to all of their CPU cores. And in order to do that, they designed Threadripper 3 to include a dedicated I.O. die surrounded by CPU chiplets. The chiplets can then request memory access across the Infinity Fabric from any of the four memory channels at any time. They didn't need to speak to each other in order to do it. Again, let's draw our motherboard. This is the board. Here is our socket. We have one, two, three, four memory channels, Oop. memory slots. We have our I.O. die in the middle. This is an I.O. die. And then we have chiplets on the side. One, two, that's supposed to be a square. Two, three, four chiplets. The I.O. die has access to all four memory channels because it goes out both sides and reaches both banks of memory. And then when one of the chiplets needs access to memory, it could talk directly to the I.O. die. That means that this chiplet has direct access to any of the four memory channels and the same obviously goes for any of these. So this chiplet can talk to 
this memory channel or this memory channel or this memory channel and it talks to it directly through this specialized IO die. Yes, there are of course other improvements made here as well, including bumping IPC and clock speeds, but by far the most significant improvement has been memory management. And that has led us here today where I can look at the 3960X and confidently state that I'll be using this chip in Adobe Premiere, where previous AMD CPUs have kind of struggled. What I wanted to do today was to see how fast the CPU actually is. And in order to do that, I'll mainly be testing it against itself. Yes, I will be directly comparing it to the i9-7980XE and the Ryzen 9 3950X in Adobe Premiere exporting. But other than that, I just kind of wanted to see if overclocking improves performance in any meaningful way or if the stock settings are pretty much good enough. I took the 3960X and popped it into the Gigabyte TRX40 Aorus Master motherboard along with a 4x16 gig kit of G-Skill Trident Z Neo, running at 3600 speed with timings of 16, 16, 16, 36. The cooler used was the Enermax Lictec TR42. I ran everything at stock, then I let Ryzen Master auto overclock the chip, and then I tried out a manual overclock. The first thing that became apparent with the auto overclock was that clock speeds just weren't really where they should be. Even though the multiplier was set to 44, average clock speeds were almost identical to what we were seeing at stock. Whereas my manual 4.4 gigahertz overclock was actually clocked as it should be. I 100% attribute this to the voltage settings, which were way too aggressive on the auto overclock at 1.5 volts. This was causing the chip to run hotter and throttle back down to lower clock speeds. I was able to manually tune a 4.4 gigahertz overclock to run at 1.38 volts, and this allowed everything to operate normally. You can see this also in the average temps, which were much higher with the auto OC than the manual OC, and to be honest, the peaks were even worse than what the average shows. Power consumption was also off the charts with the auto OC as my manual tune actually consumed less power than the stock settings, which used auto voltage. Cinebench scores were awesomely impressive across the board, as you might expect from a high core count CPU like this, with almost insignificant gains from the auto OC. At this point, it's probably obvious that using the auto tuning wizard in Ryzen Master, at least for my chip, might not be the best idea. The Blender BMW test was up next, and I've never seen a result for this render that dipped below one minute until right now. Blender isn't a program that I personally use, but it is massively popular among those who might be in the market for a CPU like this. Next up was the TimeSpy Extreme CPU test, where I wanted to see if I could crack into the top 100, and as it turns out, yeah, that wasn't really even a problem, even at stock settings. 13,178 puts me at about 40th on a leaderboard, where 13,872 is about 33rd. But hold on, there's more to that part of the story in just a second, after we talk about Adobe Premiere. Exporting was our last test, where I rendered out the same 4K project that I had tested in my 3950X video. It's my September monthly build, which is a 13 minute video with transitions, color grading effects, and overlays. Both the 3950X and the 7980XE were able to get through this in about 10 and a half minutes. But the 3960X crushed them both, hitting the sub eight minute mark with the manual overclock applied. Crazy. So let's circle back to Time Spy Extreme because Jay, Steve, Paul, and I have had some fun over the past year trying to get up onto the leaderboard using various outlandish cooling methods. I decided to see how far I could push the 3960X using a giant cooler full of ice water and an EK CPU block. I took the necessary precautions to protect my board from condensation and then went to work dialing in an overclock. The best that I could do at any voltage was 4.65 gigahertz on all cores, and this required 1.6 volts in order to complete any benchmarks. I tinkered with the settings for probably four or five hours, trying to get things running either faster or with less power, and no matter what I tried, this was the absolute ceiling, at least for the cooling solution that I was using. This produced a time spy CPU score of 14,519, ranking me 29th on the leaderboard. It also pushed my total score into the top 100, even though I wasn't even really trying to OC the GPU in any meaningful way. So yeah, this thing has some serious balls. 
Obviously the most important thing for me is Premiere and this seems to be the clear cut winner out of my current options. I'll be working with Fantex to put together a water cooled build soon using this CPU right here. So get subscribed so you don't miss it. I am thoroughly impressed by what AMD has done here. They recognized a problem, devised a solution and engineered a completely new CPU package in far less time than it's taken Intel to do literally anything. And now as a result, I am an AMD user for my editing machine. Thanks for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed today's video. And if so, please drop a like below. As always, I'll see you next time.